Now it gets a bit more interesting. Those were kind of warm-up examples. The next thing is F is a vector field that I usually like to call G. It's vaguely analogous to gravity, but it's in two dimensions. It's got a 1 over R dependence, meaning the magnitude of this guy is magnitude of R, which we calculated already to be little r, the, the scalar r is 1 over r. It's got a 1 over r magnitude dependence, and it's pointing outward because I don't want to deal with a bunch of minus signs. What does this look like, even if you don't think of it as gravity? What does it look like? It looks like a vector field that's everywhere going outward, but now instead of getting bigger as you go out, it gets smaller as you go out. And so what that does is it has a prayer of having the same flux has a really good chance of having the same flux out through this circle as it does through this circle. And that's going to make a lot of sense because if you think about fluid flow, our intuition for fluid flow is based on water. And if I have flow, fluid, some water flowing out through here, our intuition is it's got to eventually flow out through that bigger circle as well. What would happen otherwise? It would get squeezed. I'd have a bunch of stuff coming in through here and not going out there. It'd have to accumulate in here and get denser and denser in here over time. Or it'd have to rarefy, get less dense, get stretched. Now, plenty of things do that. Gases do that all the time. Um, but water does not. And so it turns out that this is going to be a model of water flowing. Um, but we, we want to analyze it a little more carefully. And so here's the mathematical way to do that. The first thing is to calculate the left-hand side of, of the divergence theorem. G dot n ds. This, all, this still satisfies the three conditions. It's, it's radial, so it's always perpendicular to, the, to that circle. It has a constant magnitude, because on the circle, it's just going to have magnitude 1 over a. And it's the length of the circle is still known. So just to go through it real quickly again, that becomes the magnitude of g that becomes that constant 1 over a. So the 1 over a comes out, and you just get the length of the boundary circle. 1 over a, that's, that fat, that's coming from the fact that the errors are getting smaller as you go out, times 2 pi a. That's coming from the fact that the circle's getting bigger as you go out, and those cancel, and we always get the same number 2 pi. OK, so this is a vector field that models flow that on any circle gives you the same amount of flow. And we're going to see there's a much more powerful thing we can say in a minute. Now, three, uh, number three, I asked you to calculate the divergence of this guy. And so that's going to be d by dx of, remember, it's, it's uh, x over r squared is one component. Let me write that down. It's x over r squared i plus y over r squared j. That's what our, a little more explicitly, what our vector field is. So we did this com computation a long time ago. I think uh, I should have done it again, but I was in a little bit of a hurry. But let me do it now. So it's a quotient rule calculation. Derivative with respect to x, 1 times r squared left alone minus uh, x left alone, and r squared is just x squared plus y squared. Derivative of that with respect to x is 2x over r to the fourth. Plus y over r squared with respect to y, very similar, 1 times r squared minus y left alone. r squared is x squared plus y squared. Derivative of that with respect to y is y, 2y. And so I get 2r squared minus 2x squared from here minus 2y squared. Hey, that is 0. That's a very pretty result, but immediately it's a very disturbing one. Because if the divergence theorem applied to our disk d, then we'd have 2 pi on the left-hand side. That was the integral. That was the flux over the boundary. That's supposed to be the integral of the divergence. But the integral of the zero function is just zero. Well, that's not true. And what's going on is, uh, we've seen this, 
with the uh, with the vortex vector field in circulation is that I keep wanting to show you that but it doesn't show up very well. Um, the vor the theorem this theorem only applies if the vector field is defined and nice technically it means continuously differentiable all over the interior of this region. And that's what's not nice about G. G was defined as r over r squared, that denominator vanishes at, at r equals zero. And remember, the magnitude of this guy was one over r. Even the magnitude, just looking at that, it gets, it goes haywire. This gets infinitely large as you go towards the origin. And so you cannot apply the divergence theorem directly to the whole disk around the origin. So that's why there isn't a contradiction here, because the 2D divergence theorem does not apply. But that doesn't say we can't apply it to a slightly different region. What we can do is use it to explain in a very profound way this seemingly fairly simple result that we had that the circle of radius, um, say, A and the circle of radius B, when we calculated the flux of the vector field, oops, that's supposed to be rather smaller, big arrows there, small arrows there. When we calculated the flux across the small circle and the big circle, they were equal. And that seemed like a trivial calculation, but the 2D divergence theorem gives us a way to pr prove that, reprove that, in a way that's much more powerful in general. And so what we do is we look at this region in here. Let's say that's our region D. And we're going to say, okay, the integral out through the boundary of that region. Oops, that's a flux integral. So the flux of G is supposed to be equal to the integral over D of div G dA. Now this really is going to be true because the divergence theorem does apply to this region because I'm t staying totally away from the bad point at the center. And we've calculated the divergence of G with a little bit of, of just s simple c uh, calculations with partial derivatives. That's known to be zero. What that says physically is there's no little bits of sources or sinks here. There's no places where fluid is created or it's expanding, and there's no places where it's destroyed. It's something you can really think of as being like water flowing. It's incompressible. And so this guy's going to be zero. Well, why does this show what we wanted to show? It's because the boundary of D is its outer boundary with the usual outward orientation going away from the origin. And so let's call that CB. That's the flux of G through there. Plus the flux through an inner, the inner boundary, but here we've got to take the direction where it's actually going away from D. Now that's inward towards the origin because it's an inner boundary. So I could either say that's going to be CA with the opposite orientation. Well, that's a very wordy way to say it. The way you actually do it is you say, let's just call that minus CA, minus the circle. And an even better way to do it is to say, okay, when I switch the orientation, I'm just going to end up switching the answer. And so now the integral, thats this is now the outward flux. That's just the standard version of CA, as if I didn't pay attention to the fact that it was an inner boundary. And so that says the flux outward through CA minus uh, is, is the same, because these guys, uh, the difference is zero. Their difference is zero, and so the flux outward through CA is the same as the flux outward through CB. So, that's another way to show that those guys must be the same. And in the next video, we'll see why that's so much more powerful than our previous demonstration.